Hello and welcome back to the ANZ HGC for the final time tonight and the final time for this four-week qualification process. It's been a long one, but we have seen some fantastic games and some displays mm. of unreal um, proportions, really, I suppose, Vandy. I'm still beaming from what we just witnessed on the stream just before, um, mm. and that has sealed the nail in the coffin for the Mickey Mouse Clubhouse. They can no longer qualify going into this uh, Premier Division, which does then raise the question, what teams will be in there? Yep. We've got here on our left-hand side, we've got GG going next. They're going to be coming in at first spot. Rich game with the second spot C. Quick Match Warriors at three. Nekumimi at four. And to finalise that fifth spot, it will be down full gaming. Van, did you think these are the five teams at the start of this four-week process you would have anticipated? Uh, I mean, that's a good question, actually. Honestly, at the start of the season, I thought it was going to be anyone's game because we've seen a couple of heroes in that summer break, in that summer period, when you practice together and you really get a good thing going just to, like, it's just anyone's game. It just depends yeah. on how you play and also just how you tilt or recover from tilt. That's something yeah. that we always talked about, especially yourself, being a former <laughs> player as well. You know a lot about what they can go. A couple of teams, I mean, they did drop out as well during the competition. And yep. that's sort of like that tilt that you just need to be able to recover from because with every sort of loss, there is something to be learned. And, I mean, that game that we just witnessed right there, perfect case in point. Like, it was so back and forth. And, I mean, chat was saying, like, I've got no more, like, nails to bite. <laughs> and I'm like, <laughs> that's how we all feel, right? I mean, at the start of the day, we knew it was going to be a big one. We knew there was a lot on the line for these teams. And as you brought up before, there is a lot of tension. There's a lot of stress. And, and the adrenaline is flowing. There were games that I've seen across this four-week process where you're thinking, man, I know exactly what it feels like to be in that situation. Yeah. And for a lot of these uh, lesser experienced players that don't really have that competitive background behind them, the longer these games can go on, the more those nerves can start to overcome your logic and the emotions start to go crazy. And uh, with that inexperience, you can start to make, you know, choke or or, or mistake and shock or so interesting to see how things have all turned out but let's turn our attention now onto this final game of the week yep. what have we got here we've got gg go next to victors off the game we just had on screen up against rich gang so this is first and second juking off so we get a little bit of an insight as to how they're going to stack up in the premier division yep and i mean so far I mean, okay, MMHC, they almost managed to take a game off GG Go Next. They are still currently undefeated in this in these pre-qualifier games. So they've got a flawless track record. Is it up to Rich Gang now to finally dethrone them, finally put, you know, a little mark on that permanent record? Oh, we'll have to wait and see because that's what we're going to be looking at here. Let's actually bring up a bit of a background of these two teams whilst we wait for these uh, guys to get themselves ready. Dark sided. Well, that's what they used to be, and that's why they got the tag there. They are now known as GG Go Next. They did have Hacky obviously leave to go to the Mickey Mouse Clubhouse, but drama aside, last week that did not seem to deter them whatsoever, and that performance and that momentum has carried on to tonight as well, guaranteeing them that spot. Whilst on the right hand side, Rich Gang, they had a bit of a uh, an interesting last week. They uh, even themselves said they were not impressed with the performance that they displayed, and even against Neko Mimi in what was going to be a very big shock upset turned out to be a win for them. So they're going to be looking to emulate the success they've had so far tonight and carried it on forward throughout. And what a fitting way, much like what I just described, it's Battlefield mm. of Eternity again, Vandy. Oh, this is the one where I believe Rich Gang, we saw them in a little bit of trouble, correct me if I'm wrong. And we were like, uh, this was the one versus Nekumimi. And we're like, oh my goodness, if they don't pull it back. But then Fesh, that madman, I just remember you saying those exact words. You're like, what is he doing? Backed by Fairy on the Uther, surviving, getting those kills and just swung the momentum of the game right back into their favor. So just as anything can really happen. And with the changes to minions and things like that, the games have been a little bit shorter as well. But in saying that, there's always room for a comeback. And that's what makes HOT so interesting. I mean, talking of comebacks, what literally just happened on our screen before, right? You're going for that core rush, and I'm like, my heart is bouncing out of my chest right now. Stop it. Like, I've got to compose myself <laughs> and not speak so fast on this microphone, Vandy. But here we are. Here we are indeed for the final one of the night. And I tell you what, four weeks, four weeks of solid competition. What does this all mean? Well, the teams like Nomia, mm -hmm. Crimson, and Outlaws, they've had four weeks to scout out the opposition, scout out who they are potentially going to be going up against. And now that we have the certainty who is actually going to be in there, they're going to have another week up their sleeve to really hone their uh, expertise and their experience to say, cool, where do we need to go? But let's jump into this one. Looks like the teams mm -hmm. are ready to rock and roll. So yep. for the final time tonight, let's get the show on the road. Let's get this party started. <laughs> 
Battlefield of Eternity. Shmada Brothers, that seems to be the talking point, but I'm still waiting for Blaze to find his uh, find his spot in the Mesa. Yeah. So, I mean, we did see a Blaze ban in that second game right there, and I believe that was almost a target ban towards Vicarac, who's shown that he really enjoys playing that hero. And he sort of knew who was to get released. Vicarac is always a big fan of trying to pick them up, see where they fit in the meta and just adopt. And I guess a lot of that can also come in trying to exploit a team's familiarity with these newer heroes. And just sort of the strategies that you come up when you sort of versus the mountain of finding out, okay, how do they work, you know? Like we're still unused to it. So that, that one didn't go through. So we did not yet get to see any Blaze being picked. And I don't think that Battlefield Eternity is going to be his map. Yeah, I would actually agree with you to a, to a degree as well. I feel as if it's one of those heroes which you're primarily choosing as a denial. I mean, the bunker is so frustrating to go up against and the ability to then jump in and out without any really punishing... Um, global cooldown allows you to juke out ultimates, prevent certain death. You know, for instance, I was uh, playing a quick match the other night, right? Pyroblast comes across, you're thinking, well, that's a typical quick match ultimate that you choose. Into the bunker, out of harm's way, speak of the devil, and he will deliver the fireman himself. Interesting. Is taken off, Andy. This might be another respect ban, or teams know that there could be a little bit of cheese coming their way with Blaze because he can really stick with the target and the sustainability that he gets as well can be outrageous in that team fight when you're just trying to take him down. I'm very, very interested. As I said, I didn't feel like this might be the map for him, but he can be such a bully, especially when you're fighting around such close quarters for the Immortal. Very, very interested, Skimmy. This Hanzo, though, no-brainer. Too good to let through. Too good to let through, indeed. And it begs the question now, do teams feel very threatened or almost um, conditioned to go for the Genji? Do they feel like they need to secure that? We've seen in the past teams definitely stray away from the idea. Actually, a lot of teams will have these drafts preset in their minds going into it, thinking if we go for this, this is how we respond, and the mind games really develop from there. The draft being such a crucial part of playing this video game. Uh, so we now have to sort of see where they turn their attention to. ETC has been the go-to for a long, long time in that warrior position, and especially with Blaze off the ball. Would have been an idea, but they do stick with the oof. They want those compositions which allow the dive heavy, or at least a divine shield focus, you'd have to imagine. Divine Shield just unlocks so many sort of possible plays and we saw the Holy Cow coming out in that last game showing some of the versatility that he can offer as well as just the armor that you get from his heels. It can be such a sort of team fight stopper when you're just looking for that final little bit of that final execute and then suddenly you're just deep and then Uther, he's like, well, jokes. The heel goes out, the armor comes out and suddenly you're like, oh my God, I'm just caught in the middle of... I guess, what is the skimmy he's saying? I'm like in the middle of like a dark alley and all these boys around me surrounding like beating you up for your money. <laughs> that sounds like me on a Saturday night when I talk my way out of it. You know, I just put him on the shoutcaster and, you know, yeah, you get it. Like, hey, so. That's why I stay at home, Ben. It's why I play quick match because there's no bullies here. There's no, no people bullies. boys in your life. No one's taking your lunch money or your dinner money or any of that. But all right, let's bring this back to the draft. What are they going to pick? That Genji as well. So we saw in that first game of the evening, with that Uther ban, the Genji was taken. But now we're seeing that Uther being picked, but the Genji still being taken. So yep. Genji, very, very popular still. He did receive a little bit of changes to his Dragon Blade. Nothing too, um, I guess, nothing too much that we need to really sort of cover to sort of uh, change to the duration. With that Anubrak, though, I really do like that pick. Just a hard CC that Anubrak can bring, as well as just that Cocoon to be able to lock out someone. That can be sort of what you want in terms of if you need to get rid of that Uther. You've got that cocoon to be able to take him out of the equation, take him out of the team fight. Exactly the same wavelength I was going with there as well, Vendy, is that, you know, the new break is definitely going to be targeted towards preventing any dive or squishy backline. I like a Leeming, for instance. Although Leeming, generally speaking, is used as a uh, counter towards that cocoon, but the cocoon then being able to come out to Uther disrupts their sort of wombo combo, if you will, and the Genji, mm -hmm. a denial pick, it really feels like for the Uther. But the response is good, and this is a bit of a throwback to what we saw in the meta at least six months back on this map especially with the Eastern region teams, primarily China, with the Tyrael and the Uther followed up by the Greymen. Used to be the Valor as well. You could definitely flex it, but with the changes, Greymen obviously that much stronger. This now just means you have potentially double dive with double uh, sanctification, and the means can keep rolling in with the Protector, by the way. And that sanctification can be so crucial in swinging the tempo of a team fight towards your favor. So that's something good. If you do have a member caught by that cocoon, you still have the sanctification to be able to collapse and make sure that that person doesn't get picked off. So it gives you sort of that buffer as well to play around with. So I do like that Tyrael pick, giving them that flexibility. It's also going to give Greymane, he's going to feel like it's supported when he does go in because Tyrael can accompany him or Tyrael can lead the charge. This Malthiel bear now, this I like. We saw how much healing... Yep. Matthew was getting through the cleave now, being able to to apply more stacks. 
of his tormented sort of um, of his souls as well. So to give him that healing, it's uh, a positive change. And I do like to see Malthus sort of coming back into the swing of things with some quality of life changes like this. I mean, there's two definitely really important reasons why I like this Malfield ban. One for the map itself, which is with his percentile shredding um, yep. in terms of actually winning that objective. But then the second beat, with that double invulnerability that you'd have to imagine and with him being able to fulfill that solo laning role, and he has a lot of protection behind him and he is innately squishy to a degree. Uh, obviously, without that soul leech, so he does need that team to back him up when he does go in, but the response is fantastic. Rhaegar taken away to prevent anybody getting from zero to 100 or back again. And, well, just like that, they come straight out the doors with a very aggressive composition. Arthur, so without a doubt, one of the best early game tanks. And Li Ming, this is the classic one. It's what you and me like to call the old the B-Sod comp. Yep. <laughs> you, you were going to oh say the re I know you were talking I wasn't going to say the re -comp. I was going to say the re -comp. Come, on, <laughs> come on, Vandy. You know me. You know me, Scooby. <laughs> <laughs> but it's but... sweet. Nonetheless, what does it bring? It brings poke. Oh. It brings engage. It's so I like good. to call this kind of like the erosion comps, right? Two stones mm. bashing at each other who can get off their ultimate, so who can utilize their skills to the greater degree of finesse. I just imagine you in just like a little sandbox playing with rocks or something when you say that. It's so funny. <laughs> like little are, young skimmy. <laughs> those are traumatic uh, traumatic childhood stories. <laughs> when you didn't have toys, you just had rocks? I did. I did. You know, I lived a very solid life and, and that's how I picked this fast. <laughs> rock solid. Quite a box. All right. But all right. If um, we look at that leaving in the Genji as well. So as you said, it's just going to be about getting those resets and we've touched on it. It will just take, you're pretty much like one domino from away from that collapse. Just like once one team member falls, it's just so easy for them to get so much additional damage to be able to take you out. The burst, the reset of their cooldowns, to be able to do it all over again. That's something you really do need to respect. And that Arthas and Lucio, it's one of those old combos that we've seen coming yeah. up now time and time again. So there's two things about this Lucio. Lucio, to a degree, is definitely not the best in his healing against what is going to be a very dive centric comp this to me suggests the idea of we're going to have fantastic engage if you get caught out alone we can run you down basically but if we are in a situation where this doesn't look too promising we can run away what this is relying on is the expertise of the leaming of the genji to get in do their job get the resets and get up because the sustain just isn't physically going to be there likewise you can make an argument for gg go next as well but the heroes except for i'd say jaina are definitely survivable in their own respect too. Now, Jaina versus Genji is an interesting matchup. Genji, for the most part, should dominate that one, but it's going to really dictate, I would say, how these warriors on both sides look to not only engage, but also peel, given they've gone for very similar archetypes of, of dive and, and wombo combo uh, block reset style. Yep, it's really nice that you bring out that point because often you'll see that Genji go in after the tanks have initiated, after the warriors are all trying to put pressure on their backline. And that's where Leeming Genji, they can actually just flank around and just target the backline directly because, as I said, they could just put everything into trying to get that one kill. That's all they really need to unlock the potential in that team fight. So when that happens, you really just need either one of two things for your tanks to come back and peel and anticipate that or have someone on standby with that hard crack control. So maybe we're in standing yeah. on the flanks to stun that Genji, stun that Leeming. Or you just need to anticipate and then make the first move. So jive in and either go on Genji or Leeming before they can go on you. Arguably, Leeming will be the easier of the two to try and focus down because all she has available is that teleport. So she has a little bit less mobility than that Genji. Well, Vandy, it is that time again. Game number three, the final one in week four. Teams have already qualified for the Premier League. This is now for bragging rights. This is for a glimpse into what you're going to see on your screens come 27th of February when the Premier League does officially kick on off. Eight teams on offer, eight teams ready to show their prowess. But let's jump into the action right here. You saw them before, you're going to see them right again in the blue team. It's GG Go next with Sailor on Utha. Doubt playing the Grey main. Azog on Muradin, Bouncy Knight on Jaina, and Deceptive Smurf rounds out this composition as the Tyrael. And on the red side, we have... Rich Gang with Fairy on Lucio, John playing Anubarak, Deuces on Arthas, Jim Jam playing Genji, and Fesh on Li Ming. Fesh on Li Ming, and this is a guy, well, I mean, we saw the scenario from it last week, right? You ban away his Valet, you ban away his Tracer, what can Fesh do? He is a one trick. He proved the critics quite wrong with that Greymane performance. And we're going to see today <laughs> if his Li Ming performance is as spicy as what he put on for us last week. It's a very quotable thing where you're like, Fesh, is he a madman? Those, that's what's going to be coming out. Everyone's going to be saying, Skimmy? Yes. Yes, he was a madman, but it definitely paid off. And I like, though, this time we can see GG go next. They're like, all right, we've heard about this madman. Let's take the gray min away from him. Let's force him onto something else. Fish as well has shown that if he's not playing the Valor, he also is quite at home on the Leeming. There he is now. 
The point I actually wanted to highlight before is that given these comps are so dive heavy, it's really, really harnessing the idea of synergy and the idea of actual tension and stress. And Jim Jam is low, but he gets taken out. A Frostbolt goes into the wilderness and it snipes him out. Fesh with the B-step saying we are not too deterred by that one. But there's the point right there. Genji going in, looking for the snipe. The retaliation comes across and the stress, the tension. These two team comps, there is no room for error. And I like this, a very, very early Kazu camp with that kill that they got. Yes, you don't really get too much of that experience, but they definitely saw something that they could utilize, and that's that Kazu camp to pressure the lane and help them push. So I like that GG go next. They're always thinking about what's the next play, what's the next play. Right now we're we'll at 10 John. John, aka Yarn, he's running away. He's gonna get taken down in the end. The bug falls to the floor. Very unable to sustain him. That is the weakness of Lucio. There is no burst healing. And that's exactly what GG go next. Looking to try and exploit with Azog low. Jim Jam on the hunt. Shurikens are coming across. The heal is there to ensure that he does not fall. But Sailor expanding the very last remnants of his mana to make sure that is the case. Now, they have Chance with the lane pushed out to go for a reset. Get themselves prepared for this first immortal phase. And timing that Bruiser Cam, very, very important as well. It can really help decide how easy the immortal fight goes for you having that extra pressure but i like this by jim jam he anticipates what they're going to do doubt is very very this low is this is beautiful this is the pressure that deuces can bring on a hero like office early game through and through straight into bounce no he's low no mana no chance but he does find the sanctity behind that wall thankfully for him he is not a casualty no first blood picked up by rich game just yet nope so with that, the Shaman camp is now stolen, so it's just going to waste a little bit of GG go next time to clear that one out. And with their damage so low, being able to, being forced to go back and heal up just means that the positioning for the Immortal, it's going to be a little bit later than they otherwise would have liked. Plus, there's going to be another Shaman camp heading their way that they'll need to deal with. That they will, and that's where Rich Gang have their attention focused so far. As we still see the top lane. Working in favor of Deuces, able to bully out uh, the Tyrion. I don't really do too much in this matchup for the most part, but that's not going to deter GG Go Next too much. Jim Jam does dive in quite aggressively. Swift Strike comes across, Stun does connect, Protect is there, but he's going to jump out. Cyber Agility does prevent that Blizzard doing the damage, but the damage is already coming across onto John once again. Yarn is going to fall on down, he has two names. And he's got two deaths to his name as well. <laughs> oh, I see what you did there, and he's not going to be happy with you, Jim Jam. He's used a Swift Strike to try and go in, but Azog is so tanky. And then once again, I'm telling you, this Uther, the armor that he's giving people, although they look deceptively low, they're not. So, I mean, that's something that's a little bit of a team play there with the wording there, unfortunately. Deceptively yeah. low, I like where you're going with this one, Vandy. I'm liking this, so I'm going to continue it. They're going to go for this fight. Looking to chase on in, taps are being used, lanes are being cleared, globes are being picked up, sweaty globes at that one! Shout out to Azure for that, but let's look at this fight going on right now. John gonna jump into the back line, Burrow Charge does come out. And look to try and take out Sally, he will have that redemption form, able to top up his members now, need it. Bouncing out is low, he's gonna be the next focal point, it's Jim Jam Cyber Agility's across that wall. But the damage has been done, the pressure has been created, and despite GG Go Next having that slight XP lead, they're the ones finding themselves behind this Immortal Race. Exactly right. And now the halftime show is going to begin. It was so, so close to being proc, but with that kill, just meant that he needs to back off. Deceptive, looking to try and get out of this. They're just waiting now for Sailor to rejoin them, and they're going to be racing this one down. But it looks like Rich Gang, they want to try and defend this one. They're not yet done. Head in the Immortal, but down in Members. Fantastic uh, flank comes out here by Deuces, looking to once again exploit the weakness of Bouncy Knight. And there comes the Burrow. The Horn meets the head. And he gets poked on the spike, taken down for free. Once again, another 4v5 situation. These kills starting to really matter as we get to these talent two advantages. Level 7 is the next one to look out for. Deceptive, looking to scout up some attention, using the smite to get himself out of harm's way. Got that mobility. Eldrin's might will ensure that he does not fall on down, but these spikes are going to be short, sharp, and consistent. Bang with the damage, and there goes the kill. Muradin falling to the floor. Now, this one, I really feel as a GG go next, they could have just let that one go just for the time being because they needed their damage there so, so badly. But I feel like there was just too much trust in Muradin's tankiness. And that was just a slight overstep that Ridge Game were looking for. That slight overconfidence. Um, comes across there, the PB acting as another member for the side of Rich Gang right now, looking to go for the skill. Deuces is low, he's out of money, he's got no chance. Same for the majority of these players right now, but Bouncy Knight rocks on up. A full health bar and a lot of mana to use. Spells are coming across, that's the combo, but no, Deuces does manage to get out alive. Bandy down to 200, and they're doing whatever they can to try and bite off some kills and buy themselves some time for this race. 
Barely skin of their teeth, but this is it for now. Rich Gang, they're trying to race uh -oh. down that Immortal. They sacrifice that Lucio. He does go down, but so too does the Immortal. They've won that first objective. It was very, very hard fought. And arguably, Rich Gang had to come from behind to get that one. And that was just through not giving that one up for free, just picking their fights very, very cleverly. And just also staggering out deaths, really yeah. utilizing that advantage. They were playing, as I said, GG Gonex, perhaps it was just a little bit of a... Uh, you know, you feel a little bit overconfident with the way things are. You're like, they can't kill us. And actually, then another kill staggered you again, so you're wasting even more time. Sailor is completely out of position here. Ran the wrong way when it came to that spin off the Immortal. And don't remind me of this Immortal. We've seen Mosh Pits get knocked back by that, but this time Sailor nearly was the casualty in that situation. He does live to fight another day. Obviously, both teams have their level 7s. So he can fight even in this one. Towers do fall. The gate is exposed. They're looking to try and put some damage on this fault of Jim Jam and Fesh being so, so frustrating to go up against. The poke is there, but Azog, as well as Dao, is starting to have enough. They want to come around with this uh, swing of the hammer. Deceptive joins the party. Fairy seems to be a focal point once again, and without that burst heal, this is an issue for them to face. Deuce is rocking up to try and contest, but it's just too little too late. The rotations are there, and much like we said during that draft, Bandy, whoever executes better will win. Yep, that's exactly how it's going to play down, but it's just more dangerous to be GG Go Next losing team members because of that reset potential, so they have more at stake to lose. But I do like the way this is going. Neither team has really bled out too much from losing objective or losing in deaths. They know that they need to soak, and with that constant pressure by Deuces, just being almost at a movable force on that Arthurs, needing as much experience as possible, but both teams are keeping up very, very evenly so far in the experience race. What an interesting, uh, I suppose, Interesting point for the the build of Jim Jam is he has gone for dodge at level 7, an ability that really was the go-to for much of Genji's release, the ability to block out multiple basic attacks. Now what this is going to do in the grand scheme of things is give him a breath of fresh air really against the Greyman. First time he jumps on in, the auto will be denied. That was so much more frustrating to go up against back in the day, but now, not as strong. Interesting to see that flare come across. Hmm. With the changes that have been made, this is just showing adaptation on the fly as well, just not using a cookie cut build. And that's what your talents are really there for, depending on who you're up against and what heroes. As you said, this dodge, very, very smart up against an executed hero like uh, Greyman, because you know the style of play. He's going to jump on in and then try to execute with that little burst that he gets. So by doing that, you just negate a huge portion of the damage that's coming away. Which game given a chance to even out the equilibrium in this bottom lane as Grammy did rotate to the top lane to pick up that Kazra in time for this next immortal phase. Phase number two in this one. Now Rich I'm curious to see. The first one, though. Go ahead. Will they do the same tactic now, Rich Gang? Will they just wait for the Shaman Camp to be picked up and then try to make a play and invade play again? Mm -hmm. Instead of being because they have the team fight. Look at this though, this is a bit of a slugfest, they're all clumping around, once again going to go for Jim Jam, but there goes the Sandberry Ring across, we're coming across, and there is going to be a sanctification if you've ever seen one. People locked in place and people falling on down. How about a Divine Shield to ensure that double immunity is the case in this talking point. Two people fall on down, no chance for a reset, but do keep your eyes peeled on Fish. He's positioning at the bottom of the screen, that's where GG go next to looking for. He's going to use the wave of force, but it's just not going to be enough, Bandy. Three members fall to the floor, and there's your question, and there's your answer. Oh, I like this. They've learned. They're adapting on the fly with GG Go Next. They were anticipating to be invaded again. They don't care about the Shaman camp. They say, all right, that's how you're going to play it. We'll just wait. We don't want to be picked out trying to take this camp. And the way they play that team fight is me very clean. And you could see as well, perhaps Rich Gang, they were caught a little bit unexpected, that just the timing of their heroics was so well done. That sanctification blocking us so much damage, played by the beautiful Ring of Frost as well. Mm, and this is uh, what really made this composition that GG Go Next to running so meta for such a long time, because the ability just to run at your opposition cause an overwhelming amount of chaos and distraction with no real chance to communicate in comms and say, what are we doing? There are no chances like that. They're going to go in, they're diving at you, there's a divine shield up before you know it, and a sanctification to sort of deter any kind of retaliation. These guys need to be on the board, they need to get some value starting off that cocoon. And a safe time was for, sorry, a safe time just being used to pick up that Shaman Camp, which will be pushing down in the bot lane. So that's the micro game going there. The rich game will have to respond, but for now, their eyes are on the team fight. They are trying to whittle down this immortal. Yeah, they yarn, yarn said enough. He's Baro charging in. The cleanse comes across the cocoon onto Uth, and no Divine Shooter is available if they need it. It's the Sound Baron, that's going to negate a lot of this damage that's come out from this Ring of Frost. 
Sanification onto four as Jim John has to run away with that switch strike. He's doing whatever he can with the dragon slave. Can he find a kill? He's desperately looking for it. There he is low. Go for the throat. Finds it. But Shane does get taken down. It's a one for one. Now with two for one. GG go next still winning with the momentum so far. Azog is going to find the kill. And once again, we see a very similar situation with Fesh trying to find whatever reset potential he can. But this is just drying up like an oasis in Africa. <laughs> Look at that, Fish is the only one left to tell the tale, and although the reset came, it came a little bit too late, and that's the pressure I really like to see coming out by GG Go Next. They understand the composition that they're up against as well, so even if the reset happens, it's a little bit too late to try and capitalize too much on it, and they knew exactly who to focus on as well. All Fish can really do is just poke on the wings, on the flank, just wait for his team. This one now will be going over to GG Go Next. Scary times now, because level 13 is on the horizon. And if an immortal that has half a shield, yes, we're only 12 minutes in, it is still definitely going to pack a punch. One person falls to the floor. A very strong siege is then able to be acquired. Looking at the ultimates, however, still got a sizable amount of time, 20 seconds at that. So just notice how they posture during the siege of Andy. That's something that I do really want to see. And you can see that huge wave at the bottom that was created by the pressure from the Shaman Cam. And look at this, they waste no time. And Juices is the one who's being constantly collapsed upon. It didn't connect, Skimmy. Ultimates or not, it doesn't seem to matter. These guys just know one thing, and that is pure aggression. Cocoon is there onto Uthi. He has the vine, should have been easy, but it's the first reset. It comes across, it's onto Greymane. And this is Rich Gang looking for some kind of retaliation, but Leeming does pay for his sins. He gets taken out. Yarn, Barrow charging into the back line, looking for some kind of feeling potential, but it's not going to be the case. Both times, one member survives. Both times, it's a hero with a reset. This time, it's Jim Jam. Oh my goodness, Gimme. That was just so well played. But I just feel for Fairy because the sound barrier is so close to connecting. But after the death that happened, it finally dropped. There is that wind up time that you just need to account for with Lucio. And it's just so frustrating when you miss it by the tiniest of margins. This is a scary situation right now because the keep is going to fall. The immortal is still available. Every ultimate is there except for Ring of Frost. Few crucial ultimates like the Sand Bear and Cocoon are still down. And I was wondering if we were going to see a posturing here by GG go next to go for the core, try and get some uh, some percentage taken off. They do go for the smart play, the cautious play, the safer play of them all, really. Definitely. Things considered. And then they've gone for the Kazra, and they're going to keep up that top lane pressure. Yeah, it's you just didn't need to take a risk there. You already had the keep. That was the big objective that you were trying to go for with the immortal being so low. I mean, nice having a kill, yes, but look at this! Chinese Bushman are deceptive! <gasps> Is he gonna get out? No, Jim Jam seals the deal. Great pick up there. Just need to be cautious as well. I love that by Rich Gang, sensing that, all right, look, they backed off. Let's see. Can we still get a kill out of this? We want to respond. We know that they're probably going to back off because they had a, an extended push. Now let's see if we can get some pushing on our own. And this is where they're going to really make up a lot of that experience that they just lost. Absolutely. And this is a note out of their book from the early game where they staggered the deaths. They were able to find kills and able to even out the score when it came to 4v5 skirmishes. But a smart play has already been achieved here. They've taken advantage of the situation. GG go next to rotated through to the bottom lane saying, well, there's no chance for you to really punish us in the top lane given that your keep has been taken. Let's get some free damage on to this bottom lane. Jim Jam is having none of that. He's going to try and cause a bit of a distraction, but it's not going to be enough. Level 16 is there, and that's going to be enough to tell Rich Gang to uh, sit around and play a while. <laughs> Loved what you did there, almost a deck of cane reference. Shaman Camp being picked up again, nice and early by GG Go Next. They just want to make sure that they have that pressure going on. And after that early invade, this time now they can take the camp very, very easily. They have all their DPS members on standby. And now look, they want to use and do the reverse, put some pressure on the Shaman Camp, force Rich King to back away. Bear in mind there is no Hobby Grand, so no chance to try and area deny on this point, but that's going to be a lot of damage that comes across as a response. Ice Block is fantastic. Allows the sanctification to land as well. Where's the divine shield going to come out? Is it going to come out? We're going to see it. Onto a Murden of all people, but it doesn't seem to matter because Denji has gone to shoot it out. Onto a material of all people considered. And it seems to be the nail on the top of this one. One falls, Deuces does as well. And Yarn, well, he was looking for a Barrow Charge, but all he finds is a pillar in his way. Vandy, what is happening? A Tyrael cocooned after his sanctification. Just. I think that speaks a little bit for itself as well. The value had already been gotten by Tyrael, so he didn't really need to do anything else in that fight besides be a soaker. And this is exactly what Deceptive and Azog have been doing. While they're just fighting over here, Azog constantly in the front line, trying to soak up as much of that damage as possible, not really letting them collapse in on this team. Notice how GG go next to playing this one. It's a 5v3. Top lane is pushing, bot lane is pushing. They can take as long as they need, and yet they win the Immortal as well. 
these guys, the only way they lose is if they choke. It, it's in a situation where they have placed the pieces on a chessboard in such a methodical manner that it's getting very close to that checkmate condition. It is, and also they're just the positioning of their warriors once again. I mean, these fights look great for fish, but look, look at the damage coming out right there. There's just no backup for Yarn. He's just caught in such an awkward position. Couldn't even burrow away. Whilst fantastic in utility, the bug is extremely, extremely squishy. And this is the weakness of this Lucio. Yes, you can be aggressive. Yes, you can run away. But if things happen like that, there's not much you can do about a sand barrel which comes across to try and negate what has been done by this River Frost. But is it going to be enough? They're finding theory. And they take her out for three. And they find a second. That's what they're looking for. Deuces is low. But Azor, he wanted a 1v1 with Fish. And the reset duo are left to pick up their wounds. But it's not going to be enough. Two catapults in the top lane. An open keep to pick up from the bottom lane. As well as a full healthy shield in the mortal vandy checkmate checkmate indeed look at this they're working on the keep as well so they're precious immortal with that full shield not even going to take any damage until it starts hammering on the core right now so this as you said all the pieces were in play and this now is finally checkmate with all those pieces coming together through the duration of that game like rich game they can't do anything at this point do but a damage effect nonetheless both these team compositions are looking to go in be aggressive and that's exactly what we saw on display divine shield is there to follow up the sanctification the core is going to fall regardless if gg go next white or not they're going to try and get some consolation prizes they do take out Greymane, but that is them on the night getting a win and it's securing themselves as the number one seed going through in it to the premier division number one undefeated seed as well <laughs> might we add so just another little interesting stat there and I really liked that game. I felt like it was always going to be a close one. But like you said, it was just setting up with those chess pieces, up team fight after team fight. And the way they executed it, so, so smart. I felt like Rich Gang, they had all the tools that they need to respond. But sometimes because they were just being forced to fight in sort of awkward spots, not just yet ready. Yes, they got those staggered deaths in the early game on the early immortal, but it's the mid to late game ones you really need to start winning. And they just couldn't. There was no executes coming out, and that was just due to the bullying, the frontlining coming out of Deceptive and Azog, soaking up so much of that damage coming their way. You'd have to argue or even make a case that, um, you know, a lot of what they drafted on the side of GG Go Next really did nullify the ability for a reset to even happen, right? A Divine yep. Shield, a Sanctification. Necessarily in terms of the execution and the timing, yes, it is important to a degree, but obviously if they can find that first kill, then yep. already... Uh, you know, you can see that they were on the back foot, Rich Gang. They were forced mm -hmm. to run away. I mean, even look at the scoreboard when it was up there. 70,000 damage done by Fish, which is the highest in the game. Second was uh, Doubt on his Grayman at 45. Like, Fish was trying. Fish was doing a lot of work. He was work. poking so much, so hard. But it was just going on to the tanks time and time again. So it's just a drop in their health pools. It just wasn't going on the right targets. Because like you said, just so much damage mitigation at hand. And if it did sort of come to shove they always had the sanctification divine shield in their banks yeah. ready to go as well yeah so the team composition on the night it's a bit of a throwback to the past i suppose you could say vanny but uh what do they say don't fix what is not broken and this mm -hmm. is what for tonight but i think that just about does it for us tonight yeah. that was week four said and done i'm gonna go through that uh, leaderboard once again as to who has already qualified because we know for sure now yep. what five teams have made themselves a contender in the Premier League division. Just a reminder, that does start on the 27th of February. We're going to get one week off. The teams, <laughs> the players, the casters, everybody involved, <laughs> a chance to rest up, get some throat lozenges, and get themselves in. But without any further ado, Vandy, GG go next. You saw them on your screen. They are qualifying as the very first seed, undefeated at that. Rich Game came in at second place. Quick Match Warriors at third. Neko Mimi at four. And downfall at five. And they're going to be joining a already stacked <laughs> Premier Division with what? Nomia, Crimson, and Outlaws. I mean, it speaks for itself. 2018 is going to be a big year. Yeah, this is the year, Skimmy, that we finally get our own Premier Division. And this is ANZ in a little nutshell. So we're super happy. I hope everyone had a fun time watching the games. We certainly had a blast. Everyone, all the cast is getting together mm. doing these wonderful games. Such good games. Like, there were always so many nail biters week after week. Absolutely at that as well. So big shout out to everybody for tuning in. We've cracked once again another major record in the ANZ region for viewers. I'm seeing 671 of wow. you right now, which is a unimaginable number if I was to try and throw my mind back to what two years ago when I think we're averaging yeah. like 50 viewers a night. The ANZ scene is is growing despite the pessimism that we do see from time to time in our scene. 
it is definitely showing signs of growth. So be sure to follow the Blizzard ANZ channel for all things ANZ Esports. Not just exclusive to us, you see stuff like StarCraft and World of Warcraft as well. But a big shout out to my, uh, I was going to say big shout out to myself. That's a bit uh, ego <laughs> still. A big shout out to everyone for tuning in. A big shout out from everyone at home as well. This has been a Games of Production and this has been the ANZ Blizzard Premier Division Qualifiers. Make sure you do come back on the 27th of February. That's when it all kicks off. We're going to see you then. But for now, good night.